I'm Jonathan Tomkin from the University of Illinois. When we talk about the fundamental forces that control the climate, we have to understand some fundamental ideas. And one of these is energy balance. Energy balance determines what temperature a planet will move to in equilibrium. Let's look at this example. This diagram shows the average temperature of Venus, the Moon and the Earth. And as you can see, they're very different. There's a number of reasons why they're different in each case and to understand why the, uh, the temperature of the Earth is 15 degrees Celsius on average and not 400 degrees Celsius on average, which is around 800 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 23 degrees Celsius on average, as it is the case for the Moon, we need to understand these fundamental forces because these fundamental factors that determine the uh, Earth's climate are changing. The average temperature of space is minus 270 degrees Celsius or minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. Clearly, this is much colder than the Earth. So why is the Earth warmer than that? The, the main reason we're warmer than that is because we get uh, energy from the sun and that warms us up. So I'm showing in a diagram here we get energy in from the sun. The question then becomes, why doesn't the Earth get hotter and hotter over time if we continually get more and more energy from the Sun? The reason is, is that not only do we accept energy, we also uh, radiate energy out. And so at the same time that we're getting energy from the Sun, we're radiating energy into space. It turns out that the point at which the Earth balances, that is the point at which the amount of energy coming in is equal to the amount of energy going out, is about 15 degrees Celsius as a global temperature average. That's around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, let's consider a new problem. What would happen if the sun got hotter? The Earth would receive more energy. Does this mean that the Earth would get hotter? I want you to think about your answer to the following series of questions. Would the total energy and temperature of the Earth change? Would the amount of energy radiated by the Earth change? Does the Earth continue to get hotter over time? This is what would happen. The energy total of the Earth would go up. We'd get more total energy from the Sun, but this means we would also radiate more energy. Finally though, the Earth would get hotter for a time, but then it would stop getting hotter because a new equilibrium would be reached. So these processes aren't necessarily runaway processes. If we make the, the Sun hotter, the Earth gets a little bit hotter and then stops getting hotter at a new equilibrium temperature. The interesting question though is, is that the Sun puts out the same amount of energy for different bodies. Venus is slightly closer to the Sun than the Earth and so receives more energy, but not enough to account for the fact that it is, it is around 400 degrees Celsius warmer than the Earth. 400 degrees Celsius is Venus's equilibrium temperature. So it's receiving some amount of energy from the sun and it's radiating the same amount of energy out. And instead of settling on the nice habitable 15 degrees Celsius that we have, they settle on a temperature that can melt lead. Why are we so different? Similarly, the moon receives almost exactly the same amount of energy from the sun that the earth does. It's also in equilibrium. Its temperature isn't changing. It radiates just as much energy out into space as it receives from the sun but it is over 30 degrees Celsius colder than the Earth, or around 70 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the Earth. Why is there such a stark difference, even though we're both receiving the same amount of energy? We see this radiation balance occur in everyday items as well. When we turn an oven on, we increase the amount of energy that the oven gets. So, for example, if it's a gas oven, we increase the amount of gas that gets burned. As that temperature increases in the oven, it radiates more and more heat. So even though we're continually burning gas to heat up the oven, it reaches an equilibrium temperature, a temperature that we use to cook our food. So insulation is very important. I want to look at a couple of extra details about insulation. Notice that I am saying insolation, not insulation. Insolation is the amount of energy being radiated by the sun. It doesn't refer to how protected we make something from radiation transfer. It's a tricky concept because they seem very similar. 
that I'm referring to insolation. Here I have a figure showing uh, the amount of insulation that the Earth receives at different times of the year. Red areas indica indicate more energy, blue in areas indicate less. Write down an answer to the following questions. Why is the equator redder? I.e. it has more insulation than the poles. And secondly, can you explain why the Arctic changes colour between the two figures? One is taken in January and the other is in April. We can explain the difference in insulation between the equator and the poles by looking at this diagram and thinking about sunlight hitting the Earth at an angle. At the equator, the sunlight is concentrated. It hit, hits the Earth straight on. At the poles, this sunlight is spread out and so is much weaker. So as a consequence, the equator receives more sunlight and this is why it is warmer than the poles. Differences in insulation also explain the seasons. The Earth is tilted at 23 degrees relative to the plane of its orbit. So sometimes the northern hemisphere is directly facing the sun and sometimes the southern hemisphere is. The period in which the southern hemisphere is more directly facing the sun means that it gets more insulation. So if we think about the example uh, of the Arctic, we can see that in the winter months, it is actually pointing away from the sun and so that energy is spread out. In the, uh, in the summer months for the northern hemisphere, it is facing more directly and so it gets more insulation. That is why we have warm periods and cold periods throughout the season. Here we can see that at different times of the year, different hemispheres receive different amounts of radiation. So this explains the seasons and it also explains why the equators are warmer than the poles. Insulation is clearly very important. But let's consider another puzzle. The Earth's average temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But Venus has an average temperature of around 400 degrees Celsius. Venus is closer to the Sun and so receives more insulation, but not nearly enough to account for this enormous difference. On Venus, lead melts. On Earth, we have uh, liquid water, which is very important for life. And consider the Moon. The Moon receives the same amount of insulation as the Earth, but is minus 23 degrees Celsius instead of uh, plus 15 degrees Celsius. So insulation cannot explain why the Earth is so much warmer than the Moon. On the Moon, liquid, ice, liquid water would freeze into ice. So we can see there is a big difference, even though the insulation level is about the same. The reason for this difference is that there are two internal factors that are very important in determining that equilibrium point, that point at which the amount of energy released by the planet is the same as the amount of energy coming into the planet. So we're going to talk about these two very important factors. One is albedo and the other is the greenhouse effect. Albedo is a measure of how reflective a surface is. A perfectly reflective surface has an albedo of 1, and that means that 100% of the energy that strikes that surface is reflected away. A black surface, a perfectly black surface, has an albedo of 0, and that means it absorbs all of the energy from that incoming radiation. And of course, uh, all the real shades that we see, grey or indeed any colour, is somewhere in between. The different planets I've spoken about actually have different albedos and this influences how much of the energy from insulation stays in the system before being radiated straight back out into space. Earth has an albedo of around 0.3 but this changes from place to place. Ice for example has a very high albedo. Fresh snow can have an albedo of around 0.8. In contrast, soil as we can see in this United Kingdom example or even plant life, such as trees or grass, can have values between 0.17 and 0.25. So as we change the surface of the Earth, we can actually change how reflective, reflective it is and change the Earth's albedo. Planets with high albedos reflect more of the energy directly back into space and so have equilibrium temperatures that are lower for the same level of insulation. This is a composite photo of the Earth with the cloud cover removed. 
As you can see, the poles have high albedo, whereas oceans have low albedo. Deserts also have high albedo, so it doesn't just mean that being a cold place makes you reflective. If we change the pattern of land use, we can change the Earth's albedo, and so this is a way in which humans can create a change in the Earth's climate. This is not the most significant way in which we are changing the Earth's climate, however. The reason for this is that albedo and insulation do not explain all the differences. It turns out that the Moon is indeed more reflective than the Earth. It has a higher albedo, and that is consistent with the fact that it is colder than the Earth. But the difference in albedo is not nearly enough to explain the enormous difference in temperature. Remember, we're 15 degrees Celsius, and, they are, and the Moon is minus 23 degrees Celsius on average. Why is the Earth so warm? The key reason is that we have a natural greenhouse from our atmosphere. With no atmosphere, the Earth's temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. So a little bit warmer than the Moon at minus 23 degrees Celsius because we're, we have a lower albedo and we reflect less light, but not very different. The major difference is that our natural greenhouse effect traps some of this energy and recycles it inside the Earth's system. So in other words, our natural greenhouse effect makes us 33 degrees Celsius warmer than we would be without it. This is very important for life on Earth. So how does this atmosphere trap the radiation from the sun? If you think about it, if it traps radiation, it should also prevent radiation from entering the Earth's system as well. We humans see in the visible spectrum. The atmosphere is transparent in the visible spectrum. That's why we've evolved to be able to see in air. The incoming light from the sun is very heavily weighted towards the visible spectrum. A lot of the energy insulation that comes from the sun is in this part of the spectrum and so can pass straight through the Earth's atmosphere without being reflected. Light is also transmitted at other wavelengths though. Wavelength is an important property of light. The wavelength of light determines what colour we might perceive. In the visible spectrum, blue light has a shorter wavelength than red light. Some light has wavelengths that we can't even perceive. So for example, infrared light or ultraviolet light have wavelengths that are outside what humans can see. Energy from the sun comes across all of these parts of the spectrum. But when energy is radiated from the Earth, the spectral composition of the light changes. In other words, the energy leaving the Earth is different from the energy entering the Earth. As we can see in this figure, most of the energy leaving the Earth is at a longer wavelength. So that is, instead of being the visible part of the spectrum, most of the energy is in the infrared spectrum. What's important about the greenhouse effect is that different gases block different parts of the wavelength. As we can see from this figure, water is very effective at blocking uh, energy that leaves the Earth, energy in that infrared part of the spectrum. But it's not very effective at pre preventing insulation coming into the Earth, that it is largely transparent to visible radiation. Another greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. In particular, adding carbon dioxide to the Earth's system blocks radiation from leaving the Earth in these areas. As you can see, it doesn't all overlap with the radiation that's already been blocked by the natural greenhouse. There's always been some carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere since uh, humans have been around, but the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing, and so that is changing the amount of light that gets blocked as it tries to escape the Earth's system. So let's think about this for a moment. Energy is coming into the Earth and then gets transformed as it strikes the Earth into a different part of the radiation spectrum. As it tries to leave the Earth, it is no longer seeing the atmosphere as transparent and so occasionally gets re-radiated back to the Earth's surface. We're recycling the energy from the Sun. This makes the Earth a little bit warmer. This is also a natural process that is extremely important for life on Earth, for without it we would be like the Moon. However, 
human activity is changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. We're adding gases to the Earth's atmosphere, some of which are new to the Earth's atmosphere and others which uh, existed at low, much lower levels than they do now. By changing the Earth's atmosphere, we're changing the properties of this atmosphere and its ability to recycle this energy from the sun in this natural greenhouse. What we are seeing today is that these human activities are increasing the ability of the Earth to trap, these, to trap the energy from the sun. So in other words, we're making our natural greenhouse more efficient. The consequence of this is, is that our equilibrium temperature is going up. The Earth's climate is complicated, however. To really understand what's going on, we have to look at observations from the past. Can we understand how the Earth's climate has changed in the past and how that change might carry through to the future? That's what we'll look at in the next lecture. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.